Hi there and welcome to lecture four for biostatistics. So today we're covering um, sort of the main um, sort of key part of statis statistics really which is statistical inference and that's the process of moving from a sample to a population. So given a sample, a subset of the population that you've looked at, how can you infer things or say things about a population which you haven't looked at in detail. So can we take a small proportion of the population and Hopefully, using the fact that it's representative, we can then sort of say something about the population. And we do that by basically knowing how, how um, statistics in the sample vary from sample to sample. And so we looked at this um, in lab four. And we're going to be looking at the sample, sampling distribution of the, for a mean. We'll show that it's a normal distribution, and then we'll introduce the idea of a confidence interval, which is essentially a way to um, describe uncertainty. So the key thing with statistical inference is that we're always interested in answering questions about a population. Okay? And to answer questions about a population, um, there's kind of two ways you can go about it. The first thing you could do is you could simply go to the population and ask that question. Right? So you could sample everything in the population, sample all the individuals in the population, and then you'll know the answer. Right? Uh, but in general, that's a very expensive way of doing things. Um, in some cases, it's an impossible. It's simply impossible from a practical perspective, and so instead we tend to take a sample. So a subset of the population is um, chosen to be in our sample, and the statistical inference is the process of using that sample to infer things about the population. So, for example, can we estimate a characteristic of the population? For example, the population mean. Maybe it's the average age, or the average income or something like that um, or you know can we can we estimate the prevalence of a disease right um, and we can do that using a sample we can estimate the prevalence in the sample and then we can use information about how uh, samples vary between samples so if you take two different samples what sort of difference are you going to get in the prevalence in each of those samples um, and you know, repeat that process many, many times and, and what sort of the distribution of prevalences you'll get across samples and then we can use that information to kind of work backwards. Given one sample, where do we expect the truth to lie? Okay, or what values for the true prevalence are consistent with the data that we might have? So just some terms to, so that we're familiar with them. Um, typically when we talk about things in the population, uh, we treat them as being fixed and we call them parameters. So a population parameter is a quantity computed from the population um, assuming that it's fixed and doesn't change. Right? So the population parameter is something that we don't know but it's a single number um, that is uh, unchanging for the length that, that we, uh, during which we're looking at the population. Right? So we don't, we don't say that it unchanges forever, that it's not changing forever, but we're, changing, we're saying that for the, for the purpose of uh, the period that we're looking at the population, we consider it fixed. Okay, and a sample statistic is the corresponding uh, thing in the sample. So for example, if the population parameter is, say, the mean age in the population, then the sample statistic will be the mean age in the sample. Right? And the key th difference between them is that the sample statistic is computed from your sample, so if you take a different sample, you'll get a different sample statistic. Whereas the population parameter is fixed. Right? It's, a, it's uh, computed across the entire population. The idea is that if you take samples in a random manner, so if you take a simple random sample for example, um, then the sample statistic will tell us something about the corresponding population parameter because the sample will be representative of the population. But the key thing we need to do is account for the sample to sample variation. So we need to understand how much um, that sample statistic will vary from sample to sample. So uh, we did this in, the, in lab four. Uh, we took a population and the, the, it was the um, age of uh, people were uh, students at Massey University and we had a look at what the population looked like and this is the, the distribution, right? So most people are, are young in age, right? Um, but there's this kind of tail to the right where we've got a few, a few uh, much older people. And given that population, um, we could compute the population parameter for the mean age and we found that it was um, sort of 28.3 years or something like that, right? Let's just say 28 for round numbers, right? 28 years old. 
Okay, and that's fixed. That doesn't change. It's a feature of the population, and we're assuming that the population is fixed. Now, in order to measure that, okay, uh, we typically we haven't measured the entire population, right? Um, so this would be an unknown value, and to measure it, we would take a sample and then compute the corresponding average age in the sample. Right, so here's one sample that we took. Okay, and you can see that the sample looks quite a bit like the population, and the average age in the sample is similar to the average age in the population, but it's just a little bit different. If we take another sample, okay, then we'll get a slightly different shape because, of course, our sample is random. And so every now and then you'll get some, you know, slightly older people, slightly younger people or whatever in your sample just by chance. Um, but what we'll find is that the sample means won't vary too much and they should be centered around the truth. Okay. We repeat this process many, many times. So if we take many, many samples, we can then get a feel for how much the sample mean varies around the truth. And you can see that when we do this, we typically get this kind of um, nice symmetric distribution, a bell-shaped distribution that's centered on the truth, right? It's centered on the true population value, um, and it has some spread associated with it. Uh, we also see that for proportions, right? So this is for the mean. So the thing we notice is that the sample means are centered around the true population mean, and that the distribution of sample means is this nice symmetric shape even though the distribution of the data was not symmetric. Okay? So the property that is making this nice and symmetric has nothing to do with the shape of the population. It just has to do with um, the sample size and the spread of the population. That's the only thing that really matters. And we notice the same thing happens with proportion. So if we took the proportion of uh, females in each sample, uh, then we find that if we take, uh, you know, the, the population proportion is a bit over half um, females. I think it was 53%, I think, from memory. 47% um, male. Uh, and when we take individual samples, then we get some variation. But on the whole, they look similar to the population, right? And again, if we look at the sample to sample variation by taking repeated samplings in a simulation exercise, and then estimating the, and then working out the proportion in each sample and then seeing how the proportion um, varies across all those samples, then we see we get that same shape, that nice symmetric distribution. And in each case, regardless of sample size, so this is samples of size 20, this is samples of size 80, and this is samples of size 320, we see that they're centered on the true value of 53%. Um, they're shaped like that nice bell-shaped distribution uh, and the spread is related to the sample size so as we quadruple the sample size so we go from 20 to, to 80 we multiply it by 4 then the spread of the data roughly halves and the same when we go from 80 to 320 that's multiplied by 4 the spread is roughly halved okay so quadrupling the sample size halves the the um, if you like the standard deviation or the the range of that distribution and this happens regardless of what the population looks like and as long as you typically have some sort of a mean type measure. Okay, so here's a, a little app that we can test this. Okay, if we have a nice symmetric population like this, then when we take samples, we, um, we get nice symmetric samples near enough and we get a nice symmetric distribution as you might think as you increase the sample size. So let's quadruple it. Right, we have the spread there, okay, as you would expect. Um, but we get the same result regardless of the shape. So if it's skewed to the left, right, tail out to the left, we still get that symmetric distribution for the distribution of the sample means, right? So even though the population is skew and each of the samples are skew, the sample to sample variation in the sample mean is nice and symmetric. So that's kind of nice, right? Skew to the right does the same thing as you'd expect. Um, and obviously as you increase the sample size, the spread of that, right? The variation between samples reduces, right? Because, I mean, that makes sense, right? You're covering more of the population. So your sample mean uh, will be closer to the population mean in each sample. So the sample to sample variation would be lower, right? It kind of makes sense.
So the nice thing about this is that the population shape doesn't matter. All that matters really is the sample size and some measure of scale, right? I mean, obviously, if I change the scale here, maybe the scale goes from 0 to 100. If it instead goes from 0 to 1,000, uh, to 10,000, then the amount of spread here is 100 times bigger, right? But it's just a property of the spread of the data, right? That's all it is. So really, all it depends on is sample size and some, some uh, measure of spread. So the key observations when we repeatedly sample is that samples look like the population but vary quite a lot from sample to sample. The sample means, so the mean of the samples that we take, don't vary as much compared to the sample data themselves, right? And then the distribution of the sample means is has that nice bell-shaped um, distribution, it's centered on the population mean, and the spread halves when we quadruple the sample size. And this is a general property. It holds for basically all uh, sort of um, sample statistics that are kind of like a mean. So it works for means, it works for proportions, it works for difference of proportions, difference of means. And there are equivalent statements for other types of um, sample statistics, such as standard deviations and things like that. Okay, They're, they don't follow a normal distribution, but they follow some other, some other shape. And so um, this is the statement. Suppose we have a population um, with mean mu and a known standard deviation sigma. Then if the sample size is large, the sample mean x bar, so that's the, the symbol that we usually use for a sample mean, uh, follows a normal distribution um, centered on the truth, so with mean mu, and a standard deviation given by this formula here. Right, And this formula here um, arises because of that um, quadrupling the sample size halves the spread type thing, right? So the sigma, that's the spread from the population. So that's your scale parameter basically, right? So that if you rescale the data, you get the same answer essentially, right? Because the sigma will, will change. And so that's just scaling it. Um, but then this one over square root n thing, um, you can see that if you multiply n by four, right? It's under the square root. So when we square root four times n, we're going to get two times the square root of n, right? So because it's on the denominator, we're going to get half 1 over square root of n. So you quadruple n, and this term here becomes multiplied by a half. So you reduce the spread by a factor of 2. And this is essentially a measure of the uncertainty, right? So the uncertainty associated with the sample mean is given by the standard deviation of the sample mean, which is that formula there. So the key... Uh, thing here is that this has nothing to do with the shape of the population. We haven't described the shape. All we've said is we have a population with a mean and standard deviation. Doesn't have to be symmetric. Doesn't have to just be unimodal, right? It could have multiple um, humps. Doesn't matter. Um, what we're saying is that the sample mean will follow a normal distribution as long as the sample size is large, okay? And that distribution, of course, is a normal distribution, which is the, that bell-shaped curve that we've been um, talking about. And um, so just to remind you what the normal distribution is, most of you have you've probably seen it before, um, but it's a bell-shaped distribution, like we've been seeing arises from that sampling process. And it's described using two parameters, um, mu, which is the center of the distribution, the mean, the median, and the mode is all at mu, right? The, the mode is the highest point in the curve, and the median means that half the data is at this side and half the data is that side, so it's symmetric. And it's also the mean. Um, and sigma is the standard deviation, so that's the basically giving you an uh, amount of spread around, the, around the, the mean, right? And they completely describe the distribution. So once you know the mean and the standard deviation, you know everything about that distribution. Okay, and there's some kind of empirical rules that are useful to remember um, about this distribution, um, which basically tells you kind of where data lie, okay? And so the idea is that almost 70% of the data, 68 is the magic number, is within one standard deviation. So that's take the mean, subtract off one standard deviation, take the mean and add on one standard deviation. That range that you get covers 70% of the data that we're dealing with, or 68%. Okay, so 68% of your observations from a normal distribution will be within one standard deviation of the center. 
95% of the observations from a normal distribution will be within two standard deviations. So take the mean, subtract two standard deviations, take the mean, add two standard deviations, that captures 95% of the variation. And almost all the variation, 99.5%, is within three standard deviations of the mean. Okay. So essentially the number of standard deviations that you are away from the centre is a measure of how extreme a particular observation are. And so all this is saying is that it's really unlikely to, for an observation to be more than three standard deviations away from the mean because the vast majority, 99.5%, are inside three standard deviations. Right? So the distance from the mean to the observation is less than three standard deviations. So um, the number of standard deviations away from the mean gives you an idea as to how extreme you are. Okay, so uh, typical observations are within two standard deviations of the mean. Um, that is 95% of observations satisfy that. Almost all, like 99.5%, are within three standard deviations. So the more standard deviations you are away from the mean, the more extreme the measure is. Okay, so to work out how extreme an observation is, you just need to know how many standard deviations away from the mean it is. So simple example, if the mean age is 28 and the standard deviation is 4, then an age of 40 would be, well let's work out how many standard deviations it is away from the mean, right? So 40 is a distance 12 from the mean, 28, right? So 40 minus 28 is 12, and 12 is 3 lots of 4, right? So to do the maths, I've done 40 minus 28 divided by 4. Right, so that observation is 3 standard deviations away from the mean, which is quite extreme. Right, less than 0.5% of observations are that extreme. 99.5% of observations are less extreme than that one. Okay, so we can use the normal distribution, knowledge of the normal distribution in order to say how extreme things are essentially what the what the likelihood of an odd event is okay and we'll be using this later when we do hypothesis testing and indeed uh, there's two ways that we can use the central limit theorem right so we know that um, given a, po a population with a given mean then samples from that population will follow a normal distribution the sample means uh, so the means computed from samples taken from that population will follow a normal distribution centered on the true population mean and with some spread, right, where the uncertainty is sigma over square root n. And we can use that in two ways, right? So we know the distribution of sample means. So if we have a claim about what the population mean is, right, so say someone cl claims that the population, that the average age of people at Massey is 30, right, then they're claiming that the population mean is 30, and so we could take a sample and see how far our sample mean differs from 30. If it's a long way from 30, then that tells us that 30 is a really unlikely um, number given um, our sample. And similarly, if we don't know the population mean, we can add just enough uncertainty to our sample mean that, that we capture the truth most of the time. Okay? So um, these two, two different uh, procedures, one's called hypothesis testing, so that's if you have a claim about the population mean, then we can test it by taking a sample and see how extreme is our sample given the hypothesis. Um, the other thing is if you don't have a um, guess as to what the population mean is, you don't know what it is, um, then you can take your uh, sample mean and you can add some uncertainty to it in order to capture, hopefully capture the truth. That's a confidence interval, okay? Right, so quick example of the concept behind hypothesis testing. We'll see this in much more detail later. Suppose someone claims the mean age of Massey students is 30 years old. Okay, then what we'd expect when we take samples from that population is that if they're correct, right, if the person um, that's making this claim is correct, then we would expect the sample means, the mean of our sample, to be close to 30. Right, and um, it'll be distributed around 30 with some given standard deviation. Okay, uh, div standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. Right, so um, to test this, we might take a sample of size 100, right, and find that the standard deviation is 9 years and the sample mean is 27 years. Right, so using the information from our central limit theorem, 
We know that the sample mean would come from a normal distribution centered on the truth, which in this ca case is claimed to be 30 years. Right, that's the claimed truth. And it will have a standard deviation of the population standard deviation, 9, divided by the square root of the sample size, 100. Right, square root of 100 is 10. So this is 9 over 10, 0.9 years. Okay. So that's what we'd expect. When we took our sample, we got a sample mean of 27 years. Okay. So how extreme is our sample compared to that claim? Well, our sample was three different, right? So we our sample says it's 27 years and the claim is 30 years, right? So we'd expect it to be a normal distribution centered on 30. Um, we got 27, which is three years away from 30. We convert that into the number of standard deviations, right? So the standard deviation is 0.9. So three units is more than three standard deviations, right? Three standard deviations would be 2.7. So it's about 3.3 standard deviations, right? 27 years is 3.3 standard deviations away from 30 years. So it's an extreme sample. Okay, so our sample data is super extreme compared to what we'd expect if the claim was right. Okay, so our conclusion would be that our sample data are inconsistent with that claim because it's super extreme compared to what we'd expect given the claim. So therefore our sample provides evidence against the claim. Okay, so that's how hypothesis testing works. What you do is you, you, you make a claim about the population. You then say, well, if that claim's true, then this is what we'd expect. So we'd expect samples to look a bit like that claim, right, centred on that claim with some spread. We then take a sample and we see you know, do, does that fit in with that distribution or is our sample really extreme given that claim? If our sample is really extreme given the claim, then the sample is not providing much evidence to support that claim, right? In fact, it's, it's inconsistent with the claim, it's providing evidence against it, okay? We'll, we'll see this in more detail later. Um, the other thing we can do is we can estimate the population mean, right? So we know that around 95% of the time, the sample mean will be within two standard deviations of the population mean, right? That's our rule of thumb, which comes from the properties of the normal distribution, right? Samples from a normal distribution, 95% of the time, are within two standard deviations of the truth, of the population mean, right? So most of the time, we know that our sample mean will be within two standard deviations of the population mean. So if we take our sample mean and just add on and subtract off two standard deviations, then that interval, that range that we get from the sample mean minus two standard deviations and the sample mean plus two standard deviations should capture the truth most of the time, right? It'll work whenever we have a typical sample, that is whenever we have um, a sample um, that is typical 95% of the time, okay? So essentially the standard deviation measure here, the sigma on square root n thing, is kind of just a measure of how much uncertainty we have from that particular sample. Okay, um, and because we've got a normal distribution, uh, twice that value would capture 95%. Okay, so this would basically get, uh, allow us to give, an, to give a, an interval that captures the truth 95% of the time. So here's the idea, right, you've got your truth, which you don't know, right? You've got your population mean, which again, you don't know. But you then take a sample, okay? And most of the samples that you take, right, when you take that sample mean and you add on the spread, so twice the standard deviation of the sample mean, so twice sigma over square root n, right? Then most of the time, you capture the truth. So there's the truth line there, right? And you can see that these intervals capture the truth. So one end is lower and one end is higher than the truth, so the, the truth is in the middle, right? But every now and then you get a sample that doesn't capture the truth, right? Uh, that should be about 5% of the time, right? 95% of the time you'll capture the truth because the plus or minus 2 standard deviation captures the truth 95% of the time. Which means that 5% of the time you're not going to capture the truth, right? You're going to be outside the truth, such as this observation here, okay? 
Now the key thing of course is that for any particular sample you don't know whether you've got the black sample or one of the red ones. But you do know that in the long run you're more likely to have one of the red ones than the black ones because the red ones happen with 95% frequency, the black ones only happen with 5% frequency. Right, so for a particular sample you don't know whether you're right or wrong, but you can be at least confident that you're more likely to be right than wrong. Right? That's the idea of a confidence interval. Right, so a confidence interval, 95% confidence interval, is one where we take the sample mean plus or minus twice the standard deviation. Okay, the standard deviation here is the standard deviation of the sample divided by the square root of the sample size. Right, it's that formula that we had before. So that means that 5% of the samples that we take are going to have confidence intervals that don't include the population mean. But 95% of them will have confidence intervals that do include the population uh, mean. Right? And reiterating this point, for a single sample we don't know which one, which case we're in. So we don't know if we have the confidence interval covering the population mean, right, which is the 95% case, or if we're in the odd case, the 5% case where we don't cover it. The 95% probability here, this confidence level, um, applies across many samples, not for a single one. Right, so given a single one, we don't know whether we're right or wrong. However, we can be confident that we're more likely to be right than wrong because in the long run, we're going to be right 95% of the time. Right, so it kind of it kind of means that you know across your careers, you're going to be either computing a confidence interval or looking at a confidence interval a whole heap of times. And 95% of the ones that you assess are going to be okay. 5% of them aren't. Right, so in the long run, you'll be right 95% of the time and wrong just 5% of the time. For a specific one, you don't know whether you're right or wrong. Okay, you just have that confidence. Okay, so remember that the population mean is considered fixed, okay, and it's your sample that's varying, right? So as you take another sample, you're going to get different numbers, therefore a different sample mean, and therefore a different confidence interval. So your confidence intervals are bouncing all about. Um, the truth is staying fixed, and so the 95% only applies across lots of samples in the long run. Okay, so the key thing really that the confidence interval gives you is a measure of uncertainty, right? So if you have a if you have a um, confidence interval that's very long, then you've got a lot of uncertainty about what the truth is, right? Because you're allowing a big range. And I guess the key thing is um, allowing you to admit that you don't know everything, right? You're saying, actually, I know this, I'm giving this range, and I'm 95% confident in it, which is implicitly saying I'm not 100% confident, right? It's a key step in admitting that the, the data you have isn't the complete data set. It's not the population. It's just a sample. It's not telling you everything. It's giving you an out, right? It's giving you a way of saying, well, actually, I was wrong in that case, but, you know, it happens. I'm going to be right 95% of the time. I'm going to be wrong 5% of the time. Okay, so how does this work in practice? Let's have a look at an example. Uh, so uh, this isn't really how it works in practice. In practice, we're going to use the computer. Uh, we're going to go this, through this one by hand just so you, so you can get a feel for how it works, and then we'll see what it looks like on the computer. Okay, so here we have an example where New Zealand beef and lamb are interested in the average carcass weight of lamb exported to the UK. So to assess this, they take a sample of 100 carcasses and weigh them, finding a mean weight of 18.5 kilos and a standard deviation of 5. And we're asked to find a confidence interval for the true mean carcass weight of all exported lamb, right? So instead of weighing them all, which uh, would be actually easy, um, let's pretend that we don't do that and it's really complicated to weigh things for some insane reason. And so we're just going to weigh 100 of them and use that to infer what the, what the population mean is, right? Okay, so we write down what we have. We've taken a sample of size 100, so n is 100. It's had a sample mean of 18.5 kilos, and it has a standard deviation of 5 kilos. Right? Uh, the standard deviation of the sample mean is then given by that formula that we saw in the central limit theorem, sigma over square root n. So sigma is 5, n is 100, square root 100 is 10, so this is 5 divided by 10.5. Right? So a 95% confidence interval would be around 18.5 plus or minus twice that number, right? So we're going to take 2 times 0.5, which is 1, and we'll go 18.5 plus or minus 1, 
which is a range 17.5 to 19.5. Right, so we'd write it up and say we're 95% confident that the average weight of lamb export to the UK is between 17.5 and 19.5 kilos. Okay. How we do this in our studio, uh, we read our data in. Right, you can do that yourself if you wish to reproduce it. Um, then we're having a look at the edit just to see what it looks like. So that's what the head command does. The two sees how many rows I want to look at. Right, so head lambs would give me six rows by default. Head lambs with the two in it gives me two rows, right, just so it can fit on the slide. So we've got a single column, weight, and then a bunch of weights listed. And then to compute the confidence interval, we use this command here, t.test. Uh, the weight variable, so lambs dollar weight. So the dollar here um, pulls out the column. So this is pulling out the, the weight column from lambs. And we've specified the confidence level at being 0.95. Okay, now the default confidence level is going to be 0.95 anyway. So, you, so this is optional if you're computing a 95%. If you're computing something other than a 95%, so maybe a 98% or a 99% or an 80% or whatever, you've got to put it in. Okay, and you get all of this output, and the only bit that matters here really is this bit here, the 95% confidence interval is 17.5 to 19.5. Okay, same answer we got by hand. Um, the mean of x is this number here, 18.5. Right, so that's the sample mean. Uh, we'll, we'll detail what all this other stuff is later on. It's meaningless in this case. Okay. Right, so what if we want to change this up? What if instead of a 95% confidence interval, uh, we instead want a 98% confidence interval? So what if we want to be more confident about what the average carcass weight of exported land would be? Okay, we're not happy with 95% confidence, we want more confidence. Okay, so you remember 95% confidence gave us a range 17.5 to 19.5. What do you think the range would be to be 98% confident? Would it be a bigger range or a smaller range? Have a think about that. Okay, let's see. So, in order to be more confident, we need to capture more of that normal distribution, right? 95% captures plus or minus twice the standard deviation, right? 99.5% uh, would be uh, would be three times the standard deviation, right? From our rule of thumb, remember one standard deviation is 60, 68%. Within two standard deviations, 95%. Within three standard deviations, 99.5%. So in order to be 98% confident, we've got to have a um, we've got to be somewhere between two standard deviations, which is 95%, and three standard deviations, which is 99.5%. Right? So somewhere between two and three standard deviations would capture the truth. Okay, so the computer does this for us basically, but essentially what it, what we need to do is we need to work out how many, you know, within how many standard deviations do we capture 98% of the data of a normal distribution. Okay, and so it turns out that in that case, uh, in this case, the, the value uh, number of standard deviations is 2.365. So if you're, um, so 98% of uh, a normal distribution uh, values that come out from a normal distribution are within plus or minus 2.365 standard deviations from the mean. Computer works it out for us. The formula for the confidence interval is still the same, right? It's still sample mean plus or minus a number of standard deviations times the standard deviation of the sample mean. Right, so for 95% we just use 2 because 2 standard deviations capture 95%. In this case we want to be 98% confident so we're going to have to use a number bigger than 2. Um, in this case, the number we've got to use is 2.365, okay? Now, in general, of course, the computer will do all this for us, so we don't need to know how to work out the 2.365 or anything crazy like that. The only thing we really need to know is that kind of rule of thumb thing. One standard deviation, 68%. Two standard deviations, 95%. That's the one we'll be using the most. And three standard deviations, almost everything, 99.5%. Okay, so our... Confidence interval, anyway, we can compute the same way if we manage to work out that number, and we'd get a longer one, right? So to be more confident about what the population mean is, 
we're going to be less precise about what the answer is, right? We're going to give a broader range. Okay, if we want to be even more confident, say we want to be 99% confident or 99.9% .9 confident, we're going to get a, give a bigger range again. So there's a trade-off here between having confidence in your answer and being precise in your answer, right? So if you want to be super confident, then you're going to have to be less precise. You're going to have to give a broader range. And of course, a broader range might be less useful for people. You know, it's essentially you're giving a, a less useful answer because you're, you're giving a, a, a big range for the possibilities of the truth. So there's a trade-off, and the 95% level is a kind of a, a, kind of a happy medium in that trade-off, right? You're, you're, you're giving yourself confidence, um, but you're not giving yourself too much confidence that's such that your range is, is too long. Um, in our studio, obviously, we can just basically change the conf level bit, and it takes it care of it for us. So there's the 17.3 to 19.7. Okay, this is what we'll be doing in practice. We won't be doing these computations in practice. Okay, we've got computers. That's what we use computers for, right? Okay. So there's a number of assumptions that um, kind of are underlying this theory. And the key one that we're, we're making really is that the sample mean follows a normal distribution. And that assumption is OK as long as the sample size is large enough because the central limit theorem tells us so, right? The central limit theorem says if the sample size is big enough, then sure enough, you get a normal distribution. All right, so our assumption is that we have a normal distribution and the central limit theorem te is telling us it's all good as long as the sample size is big enough. Now, the central limit theorem is a bit tricky here because it doesn't tell you how large is large enough, right? It just says as long as n is large enough, but it doesn't give you any constraint on what how, how large large should be. Okay, and this is where the shape of the population comes in, okay? Um, so the central limit theorem says the shape doesn't matter. You just need the sample size large. But it turns out there's a link between kind of how extreme the shape is and the sample size you need, right? So essentially, as, this, as the um, shape of the distribution gets more and more skew, you need a bigger and bigger sample size, okay? So if the population is normal, right, so it's a nice bell-shaped, symmetric shape, then the central limit theorem holds regardless of n, Right, so n can be 2, sample size of 2, and the result is still the same. If the population is not normal but reasonably symmetric, then a small n will be okay. So say n is 20 or 30 or so will be fine. And as the population gets more and more skew, then you'll need a larger and larger sample size. So maybe you'll need 100 or so. Okay, so look at the shape of your data right look at the shape of your sample because that's telling you some information about what the shape of your population is and if your population if your sample is really really skew then you're going to have to make sure that your sample size is larger okay in most cases you'll look at you actually only you know 50 or so samples is probably enough so that's the key assumption, right? We make the assumption that the sample mean follows a normal distribution. Note that, the, that we're not making the assumption that the sample follows a normal distribution, the sample data. We don't care what distribution they are, as long as they're not too skew, right? The sample mean follows a normal distribution, okay? And the central limit theorem tells us that that is true as long as the sample size is big enough, right? And then the big enough bit is where the, the shape of the sample comes in. But there's some other dis um, assumptions we make, and the key one really is that the sample is, um, you know, is it representative of the population? Okay, so for example, do we have a simple random sample where every every observation in our sample has been has been picked purely at random using a run random number generator or similar? Um, is it representative of the population? Okay, if these things uh, don't hold, then the central limit theorem doesn't hold. Okay, are the observations in the sample independent? Okay, so what I get, um, uh, um, so what I'm getting at by that is, are, are they related to each other in some way? So, is there clustering? So, for example, if you're sampling, um, you know, the prevalence of a disease in in cattle in New Zealand, you know, have you made sure that you haven't just gone to three farms, right? Where you'd expect the prevalence of each animal among the animal to be somewhat um, dependent on the management style of the farm, right? So if you look at the, the 
you know, proportion and herd to, on the same farm, you're likely to get similar numbers. Right, so there's correlation there. Um, that wouldn't be a random sample um, suitable of scaling up to the, to the population, or at least you'd have to make some adjustment, right? Um, and, um, you know, are the measured values accurate and consistent for each unit in the sampling? If you're doing some measurement, is the thing that you're using to measure, the scales or whatever, is that correctly calibrated each time you're using it, or is there drift? such that your later measures are, uh, you know, systematically higher than your earlier ones or something, right? There's a whole heap of assumptions about the sampling process, about how the data are collected, that are usually more important than, you know, this assumption that, they, that it follows a normal distribution. And the reason it's normal important is the central limit theorem tells you that your sample uh, means follow a normal distribution anyway, in most cases. So the, how the sample is collected is even more important. And that's really what the epidemiology part of the course has really been addressing, right? Is, you know, um, under, under which circumstances can, can we in, in fact infer things about the population? And it comes down to essentially how the, how the data are collected. Are the data representative? Okay, so that's basically how confidence intervals work. Um, we'll see more um, of that in the uh, Lab 5 uh, this week. Um, Notice that we can assess claims using the confidence interval, right? So the confidence interval gives you a range of plausible values for the population parameter to take, right? So in our um, carcass weights, we, we were 98% confident that the, that the weight was between 17.3 and 19.7 kilos. So if I were to make a claim, I could assess that claim by seeing whether it lands inside that interval or outside that interval, right? So if the, if the claimed value is inside the interval, then it's consistent with our data, right? Because our data are telling us this is the set of plausible values and the value that you're claiming is plausible, right? Uh, if it's outside the claim, that interval, uh, then you've got evidence against, right? So your, 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 um, your, your sample data would be saying, well, I think it's somewhere between 17.3 and 19.7. And then someone comes along and says, no, it's 20.8. And you can say, well, hang on a sec. My sample says it's between 17.3 and 19.7. 20, 20 20.8 is not in that interval, so my data are not consistent with your claim. Right, so you can answer questions about claims by using the confidence interval. Right, so here's an example here, right? So we've got 17.3 kilos and 19.7, that's our 98% confident uh, range. And then we've got a claim here, the UK authority claims the carcass weight is 17.7 kilos, do you agree? Well, 17.7 is inside my uh, level of uncertainty. So sure, it's a possibility, right? 17.7 kilos is consistent with this range. So our data are consistent with that claim. What if the claim of the carcass weight was 20.5 kilos? 20.5 kilos is outside this range, right? So our data are not consistent with that claim, okay? So by using a confidence interval, you can answer questions about specific claims. We'll also see how to answer this a different way using hypothesis testing in lecture six.